But thank you again for joining um, me today. I'm going to be presenting the results of a study that we did examining and developing communication guidelines for septic to sewer conversion programs in Florida using a community-based social marketing approach. And the rationale and justification behind this project was that septic to sewer conversion programs are really being embraced at the local and statewide level, but that's not without their own inherent challenges and controversies um, from the community perspective. And so even though we're seeing support and we're even seeing funding for these projects, that's not necessarily translating to adoption. And so we wanted to look at this from a communication standpoint and see maybe if there was a way that we can improve our outreach and education to these communities to get better acceptance and buy-in. So when we're talking about large infrastructure projects, um, usually outreach and communication and engagement with local communities is kind of an afterthought. It's not something that we focus on. Um, and so the typical approach is really just trying to share as much information as possible with as many people as possible, and that's considered to be successful engagement. However, when we're talking about environmental projects whose success hinges on behavior change, we really need to make sure that we're um, specifically targeting our audiences and engaging them and communicating with them effectively so that they are um, buying into that behavior change and adopting that behavior change and not just sending them information. And we know this because information and knowledge alone is rarely a barrier to adoption. There's a number of reasons why audiences might resist change and rarely is it because they're not aware of or they don't have sufficient knowledge in order to do so. Something they might sometimes, um, you know, they may be aware of the need. So, for example, with septic to sewer conversions, they might be aware that there's a nutrient issue in their community, but they may not necessarily be familiar with what behavior they should be adopting in order to um, negate that negative impact. Alternatively, they may know, know about a behavior, but they may perceive too many challenges with adopting that behavior and making that change. And this is what we refer to as those barriers to adoption. And a third reason is that um, individuals may know about it. They may not perceive too many challenges associated with that new behavior or that change, but they may perceive that what they are currently doing is just more beneficial. And oftentimes what they're currently doing may be doing absolutely nothing at all, as is the case with septic to sewer conversion projects. You know, the alternative to converting to a septic system, uh, to a sewer system is doing nothing and just existing in their current septic system. So that's where community-based social marketing really comes to play. It's a strategy that incorporates both social and behavioral sciences with marketing techniques in order to engage individuals in voluntary behavior change. Depending, there's a couple models for social marketing and depending on what model you look at, there are a number of steps. Um, the one I'm gonna present to you today has six steps and this project really focuses on the first three. And that's what we're gonna be presenting to you today. So the first one is choosing behaviors. And when it comes to um, septic to sewer conversion, that's fairly straightforward. It's adopting sewer systems and connecting to centralized sewer. But in other community-based social marketing, essentially what you wanna do is choose that behavior that's gonna have the greatest influence on whatever environmental impact you're seeking. So. You want to identify what behavior individuals can engage in that's going to have the biggest impact. In choosing those behaviors, you also want to choose your audience. So we can't, this is not an approach where we want to be able to educate the masses and expect them all to be able to engage. We really want to focus on a specific segmented audience and select that audience based on those that are going to give us the biggest return on our investment. We know that whenever we're doing large environmental programs um, and projects that they're resource intensive and we simply cannot 
um, reach everyone. So we want to select that audience that's going to have the biggest return on investment if they engage in the selected behavior. For us, with septic to sewer conversion, that's relatively easy because the behavior is already identified and oftentimes so is that segmented audience. The second step is conducting formative research. And so that's really understanding, going back to you know, why someone may not make a change or what that barrier to change may be. That's doing the formative research to understand what those barriers are and also what the benefits are to associated behavior changes and developing strategies, that third step, to balance the two out and promote the benefits over those barriers. So that's what I'm gonna to present to you today. This is not gonna be an in, a really in-depth look at community-based social marketing. I just wanna give you a general idea of what it is so that you understand what this project was, how we did it, and how you can hopefully take everything that we developed and packaged for you and implement it in your own communities through steps four, five, and six. So piloting it, maybe tweaking some things to really meet the needs of your local community, implementing it on a larger scale, and then evaluating it. And that evaluation is relatively straightforward. It's oftentimes one of the hardest things for us to do, but for septic to sewer conversion, it's simply the number of individuals who are going through that conversion process. So for us, evaluation is actually really easy. Okay, so as I mentioned, social marketing is this balance between social and behavioral sciences and marketing. And we have to understand that marketing mindset because this is really how we're going to be developing that communication strategy and those guidelines for you. So when we're asking people to change or to adopt a new behavior, they must alter an existing behavior. And so we have to understand what barriers they may have to that new behavior so that we can overcome them. And these barriers are gonna be um, audience dependent. And that's why we want to segment our audiences so we can specifically identify those barriers and develop strategies to overcome them. So that ultimately our communication strategy, our outreach and education is gonna make sure that the benefits associated with septic to sewer conversion are outweighed by the perceived costs. Again, looking at this and framing this in a marketing um, light, there are four P's associated with marketing, and that's also what you're going to use for this communication strategy. The first one is product, um, and this is essentially the behavior that we are asking individuals to change or to promote. The product in this case is converting over to centralized sewer from septic systems. Price is the cost to the individual for making that change. There may actually be a monetary cost associated with it, as there is with septic to sewer conversions, but there's also those barriers. So those barriers, the perceived challenges associated with making that change are also a price that we have to overcome. Place is the location in which that change is going to take place. And for septic to sewer conversion, that's fairly straightforward and easy, as it's the home. And last is promotion. And this is probably that fourth P that we're most familiar with. And this is actually how we disseminate information. How do we communicate with the, our segmented and targeted audience? Sometimes there's a fifth P and that would be policy. And for many of us, especially when we're talking about septic to sewer conversion, policy is a really strong player in this. And it's gonna determine whether or not this is a voluntary or a mandatory program the types of septic to sewer conversion um, that's going to take place in the community. And that's going to sort of have to become part of this marketing mix that we communicate to the public. So the purpose of this project, again, was to use formative research methods that social and behavioral science to develop a statewide education plan for septic to sewer marketing using the lens of community based social marketing with the hope is that we get greater community buy-in and acceptance for these programs so that we're more successful. The methods for our project, um, I'm gonna 
sort of lay them out as you would the methodologies, those six methodologies for community-based social marketing. So the first one was selecting a behavior. That's pretty straightforward and easy. It's converting from septic systems to sewer systems. Identifying the audience. Again, you all have already done this for us. So septic to sewer conversion was really a great sort of pilot case study for us to examine for community-based social marketing, because in identifying locations in the state that are eligible for conversion that have hookup available for central sewer, you've already segmented that audience. Then you've also prioritized those communities that are eligible based off of having that greatest impact, primarily nutrient um, reduction. So you've already selected the behavior and identified your segmented targeted audience, which made it relatively easy for us to move forward with this project. But what we did want to know is that we have um, a very geographically diverse state, and we know that these septic to sewer conversion projects are happening throughout the state at different locations. So whether or not we could approach this from a statewide perspective, or whether or not we had to filter down our um, marketing strategies to a more refined scale. So we used our methodologies looking both statewide and then also looking at three state, um, three county level case studies. We examined Brevard, Martin, and Miami-Dade counties, which are all very different. They're all currently undergoing um, septic to sewer conversion programs, but for different reasons, going through it in different processes and are having different experiences. So this allowed us to give sort of a regional comparison as to how we could or should move forward with developing a communications plan. So the third step is that uh, research component. It's that social science research to really identify what those barriers and benefits to conversion are. We did this in a three-step process. So we worked very closely with our county um, partners in Brevard, Martin, and Miami-Dade counties, talked with them and introduced them to the project, and heard from them um, different communities that were proposed to have conversion, but that weren't necessarily engaged in the conversion process yet. The reason why we wanted to do that is because we wanted to speak to community community members before they were influenced by any existing education or community strategy. So we really wanted to have this open dialogue with them and conversation with them about these projects without them having been previously influenced. Um, our intent was to do focus groups and we were able to do one focus group with the community in Martin County, but because of COVID, most of um, the research started with phone-based interviews, so um, individual or, or couple interviews. And that interview and focus group conversation from each of those three counties, we were able to analyze, and that informed a more robust online survey instrument, which we disseminated statewide as well as individually to each of those three counties. So again, we were able to have that comparison. So this is um, a snapshot of the results for our statewide survey. We had 517 individuals participate. We had um, a fairly good uh, participation throughout the state with the exception of sort of that Swanee River region in North Central Florida. We had more males than females, although um, it was fairly balanced. We had about uh, half of our participants living in urban or suburban areas about 20% uh, classifying themselves as rural areas, another 19% living in subdivisions, and then about 9% living in more of a downtown um, urban area. Also important to note some of the demographics, um, and this is just a snapshot, we have more demographics that we're able to compare from. Um, but one of the other things we assessed is whether or not they had pre lived previously in a home that had a sewer system. And a large majority, more than 70% of our respondents did. And this is important because previous experience has a great influence on future changes and decisions. We also wanted to know, since these were all septic owners or, or 
Um, and we only looked at homeowners. We didn't look at individuals who are currently renting because they weren't going to be necessarily the ones making the decisions in those properties. Um, so we wanted to know, had they experienced or are they in a community that's planned for sewer conversion? And what we found is that about 39% of them were in a community that is um, either past, current, or completed uh, septic to sewer conversion projects. And of those, about 28% of them are voluntary. And this is important because for successful community-based social marketing, um, it really should be a voluntary behavior change. A lot of the principles and the suggestions that we're gonna meet that will be made will be appropriate for those mandated or mandatory programs, but the tenant behind social marketing is that it is a voluntary behavior change. So um, we are finding that this is a good strategy for these types of programs and that our results are appropriate. So this is the part where I'm gonna share um, the survey results for the statewide survey. And first, um, we wanted to assess knowledge. So as I said, communicating knowledge and knowledge alone, communicating information isn't enough for an effective outreach and education campaign, but knowledge can be a barrier. And so we wanted to assess um, individuals perceived and actual knowledge on these programs. So all of the graphs, there's gonna be a lot of figures that I'm gonna share with you and they're all laid out relatively the same way. They all have a, a bar graph um, using Likert scales with the negative end of the scale being on the left-hand side and the positive side of the scale being on the right-hand side and the orange being um, where the majority fell. So this was respondents self-perceived knowledge of septic to sewer conversion. So it's not their actual knowledge, but how they believe um, how knowledgeable they believe they, they are. And we found, um, generally speaking, that they perceive themselves to be fairly knowledgeable on all aspects of septic to sewer conversion. They thought they were most knowledgeable on homeowners' responsibilities for maintenance um, and understanding the advantages and disadvantages of sewer and septic systems alike. They were maybe less confident in the steps involved in septic to sewer conversion, as well as the recurring financial costs associated with these projects. The next thing that we wanted to investigate was their actual knowledge, their objective knowledge. So we asked them a number of questions that had a correct, um, there were multiple choice questions, and this is the percent that answered the questions correctly. And what we found is that, generally speaking, the level of objective knowledge was fairly high, all things considered. So one of the questions that we asked is, who is primarily responsible for the residential septic systems? We had more than 80% of individuals knowing that it's the homeowner was uh, responsible. We asked, um, we showed them the pictures on the left hand side and asked them what type of treatment systems they were. And we had a higher level of knowledge for septic systems than we did sewer systems, suggesting that if individuals are going to be connecting to sewer, that maybe there's an educational opportunity about understanding what centralized sewer is, how it functions, and how it's different from their previous uh, wastewater system. The last question that we're showcasing here, I thought um, was really interesting. So if you look at it, it's only 33% of the respondents got um, the correct answer. The question being, how often does a household septic system typically need to be pumped out? And if you're looking at that, you're saying, oh my God, we've been talking about this forever. How do people not know? But really almost about 90% of our respondents actually had three years or less so they were knowledgeable about how often septic systems needed to be pumped out and actually thought that three to five years was sort of the minimum amount of time. Um, but this is one of those examples where we know that knowledge, just because individuals knew that septic systems had to be pumped out regularly, does not necessarily always equate to behavior change. So we know that residents now know this information, but we also know that residents are not actually pumping out their septic system as frequently as it should. So this is kind of an example of 
when knowledge doesn't necessarily equate to behavior change and that we need to be communicating differently. So just a review of the knowledge aspect of the survey. Knowledge itself can be a barrier to adoption, um, but surprisingly, people were more knowledgeable than we originally would expect. However, there were gaps in the details especially subjective assessments indicate that there are educational opportunities in the steps involved in the septic to sewer conversion, as well as the reoccurring costs associated with septic to sewer conversions. And so these are opportunities when you're developing your communication um, uh, tools, these are things you're gonna wanna focus on because these are gaps in knowledge. Objective knowledge assessments suggest that individuals have a better understanding of septic systems than they do central sewer. And this is also important um, because we want to make sure that there is a thorough understanding and knowledge of sewer systems since this is gonna be the primary wastewater treatment system for these communities. The next thing we wanted to look at was attitudes. So do people feel sort of negatively or positively about the idea of septic to sewer conversion programs? We provided them with a list of 10 words with um, both a negative and a positive influence, and we had them sort of rank themselves uh, where they fell on the line. We converted that to a scale of negative three being the most negative and positive three being the most positive with zero being a neutral mark. So essentially, if the line falls to the right hand side of zero, it's a positive attitude towards um, septic to sewer conversion. And if the line falls to the left hand side of the zero mark, there's a negative attitude associated with it. And what we're finding for all of these descriptors for potential septic to sewer conversion topics, there is a general positive attitude towards these programs, which is really good because it means that we don't have to spend a lot of time and effort in trying to convince people otherwise. They already have a positive feeling towards these programs. However, opportunities for additional engagement are the ease associated with these projects. So we know that they, you know, they don't necessarily think that the entire process is easy. Um, so that's an opportunity for us to improve our engagement with communities. It's also a slightly negative um, perception on the expense. But we often hear as costs as being that massive barrier. And while it is negative, we're not seeing a huge um, dip to the negative side. We're just seeing a slightly negative, which again is good. It means that this is an opportunity where we can engage and make changes. So overall respondents had a slightly positive attitude towards converting to septic to sewer, which again, is a really positive thing for us. It means we don't have extra hurdles that we have to jump over to make these programs successful. Respondents were more neutral in their perception of whether conversion was difficult or easy, and they had a slightly negative attitude regarding the affordability of septic to sewer conversions. So these are both opportunities for us to engage more in our communication tools. The next thing that we focused on was the perceived benefits and barriers, and this is really the meat of um, the social marketing strategy is really trying to identify those benefits, identify those barriers, and make sure that we can have those benefits um, be greater or more substantial than the perceived barriers. So we listed a, a number of beneficial attributes um, that were provided to us that we received from those individuals in the interviews and focus groups about converting from septic systems to sewer systems. And what we found is that for every attribute that we listed, our um, respondents agreed. They had a positive feeling that these were benefits. So um, the highest level of benefits ranking as reducing maintenance burdens on homeowners, freeing up land for other purposes, um, with the least sort of beneficial aspects of conversion projects, reducing storm associated flooding, or that it makes them a better neighbor. And these are opportunities where, again, this is that statewide assessment 
And so these are opportunities where you really want to talk to your local communities and engage with them because you might see shifts or fluctuations in the rankings of all of these benefits. And that's what you're going to want to communicate to your public about. Now, interestingly, most of these projects, as we know, as environmental resource managers and educators know that these projects are done to improve environmental health, primarily nutrient management. However, that ranked on the lower end of benefits for our communities. So while respondents recognize that it's a benefit and they still agree that it's a benefit, it is not a top priority for them. And so while we may be communicating and highlighting the importance of these septic to sewer conversion projects for environmental health, that's not a priority for our respondents. And in fact, human health is uh, ranked even higher than the environmental health. So we need to be communicating with our respondents in a way that really meets their perceived benefits. Next, we focused on the barriers and we looked at external barriers, those that individuals really can't influence and internal barriers, those that um, pertain to the individual themselves. And what you can see is that there are only two of the attributes that we listed that our respondents agreed, yes, these actually are barriers. The first one is lack of availability of a sewer hookup. And when you're talking about um, septic to sewer conversion projects, not having an available sewer to hook up to is definitely a barrier, but probably a barrier that we are not going to be able to address in the immediate future. Those are much more larger infrastructure projects. Our targeted audience won't be selected if there isn't a central hookup available. So that's not necessarily an external barrier that we need to be focusing on. The other external barrier that really rose um, was the upfront financial costs of converting to a septic system. The others, the inconvenience and disruptions of property, um, those fell in the neutral range. And so we don't want to avoid them. We don't want to pretend that they're not barriers, but they're not necessarily something that we have to overcome. We can acknowledge them, we can mention them, but it's not necessarily something that we have to go out of our way to overcome. The internal barriers, you can see we listed a suite of um, potential attributes, such as lack of a desire to convert, lack of clear benefits of conversion, not wanting changes in the local community, um, not having enough information or knowing how to begin the process, fear of large scale sewer spills, and then not just simply not having enough time. We found that every single one of these fell within the neutral um, aspect of barriers, which again is a good thing. So we're seeing all of the attributes being recognized as um, benefits and very few of our list of barriers actually being recognized as being significant barriers to conversion. So while again, we want to acknowledge these and recognize these and that the priority and ranking of these may differ from community to community, overall, um, they're not a huge barrier to conversion. So we knew from talk, doing our interviews and doing our focus groups and talking to our case study communities and county um, partners that cost, especially um, upfront and recurring costs, was going to be a barrier. It was going to arise. And so we specifically asked the question in our survey, if the upfront cost of converting from a septic system to a sewer system was dispersed over time, would you be more likely to convert to a sewer system? And the large majority, 79% of our respondents said yes. Now saying yes and you know, actually doing that are two different things. So we wanted to sort of gauge the strength of that relationship by asking them how much more likely would they be willing to convert. And our respondents fell in that extremely more likely range. So the one major barrier, external barrier that we had, which was those upfront costs, um, essentially disappears if we are able to um, disperse those costs over time. So a review. 
Respondents agreed that all of the attributes were benefits to conversion, but that um, reducing maintenance burdens and freeing up lands was kind of the primary things that they saw as being a benefit to these projects. The greatest barriers um, was essentially lack of availability and upfront costs. Those are both external barriers and they were neutral to all other external and internal attributes. But barriers of upfront cost could be reduced if costs are dispersed over time. So our one significant external barrier can be eliminated if we can get really creative and figure out new and different ways to fund these programs. So I know that funding is probably one of the biggest challenges associated with these programs and that every community is doing it differently and that for many of them, they're being funded by three or four different pools of funding. But if we have a way to reduce those upfront costs even a little bit, our success and acceptance of these programs um, is going to be so much more significant. So the next thing that we focused on was communication, because this is an outreach and education plan, how people actually want to get their information and what information do they want. This is a lot going on in this graph, but essentially I'm going to st distill it down for you. First and foremost, the majority of our respondents, 62% of our respondents have looked like they physically went out and looked for information about septic to sewer conversion at some point in the past year. If you recall, only about 39% of our respondents were actually in a community that is either had undergone or is undergoing septic to sewer conversion. So that means even more individuals, those that aren't in communities are looking about information. So they're interested in this. Now I want to focus you on those little orange dots. That aligns with the right-hand side of the graph as how much information individuals have received already about septic to sewer information. So not them going out and trying to find it, it's how much was received. And you can see that across the board, regardless of source, individuals have received very little information about septic to sewer conversions. Focusing on the left-hand side of the graph, um, we asked them, who do you want to get your information from? Who are you looking to, to receive information about septic to sewer conversion? And what they found is more than 50% of our respondents are going to county government officials and local wastewater utility. So what this means, sort of distilling this complicated graph into you know, a sentence or two, is that individuals want information. They're actively looking for it. And this is an opportunity for county governments and local wastewater utilities to deliver, to be a source of information to the public with very little competition. So take advantage of that. Take advantage of the opportunity to communicate to your residents because they're looking for the information and thus far they're really not getting anything. We provided a list of um, potential items regarded to septic to sewer conversion that they may or may not find useful and they, we asked them to rank their level of usefulness. And essentially anything you could think of that we threw at them, they found useful. What this means is that you can't provide them too much information. Individuals are really interested in learning about this information. Everything from um, timelines of construction to the actual um, costs of, of these projects, regulations, if there is any policy associated with them, uh, responsibility, evidence-based benefits of septic to sewer conversion for the environment for communities or homeowners. Contact information for individuals associated with the project. That's something that came out a lot at the focus groups and interviews is that people wanted a person to be able to contact if they had questions. They didn't want to be diverted to um, a black box recording or not really have someone that they could ask questions to, as well as a list of contractors involved in the conversion project. And then how do they want to receive that information? Print materials mailed to them and via websites. Of secondary usefulness will be short online videos and community meetings. 
So overall, in terms of communication, respondents were most likely to consult county governments and local wastewater utilities about septic to sewer conversion programs. All topics were perceived as being useful, but the most useful information was about construction timelines and costs, but you can't really can't go wrong with providing more information. And respondents want um, that information disseminated via mailed print materials, websites, short online videos, and community meetings. Okay, so that's kind of the content. Now, how do we actually disseminate this? How do we give this to the community and um, package it in a way that meets that marketing mix that really is gonna influence individuals to make that behavior change? This is the fun part of the project. This is where in community-based social marketing, there are a variety of tools that you can uh, choose from a lot of tools in the toolbox. We selected those that I thought sort of were most representative of both the behavior change as well as the data that we received from our survey. Um, so I'm going to present the strategy to you. We also, I created these hypothetical um, examples. The intent is not for you to take these examples and, and just change your logo and put them in the community. These are just to showcase more um, what it would look like in a real world scenario. So the first tool in the social marketing toolbox is audience. Um, and this is where we were able to compare some of our different counties with our statewide survey to see whether or not the data that we can be used and the approach that we develop can be done at a statewide level or if we really have to um, make this very specific to our targeted communities. And essentially what we found is that no single approach will appeal to all. So a single campaign should include several aligned messages and formats. And while we did see differences in our counties, um, the differences were not substantial enough that if you didn't take a multi-message um, approach or multi-format approach, that there um, perceptions and priorities wouldn't be captured. So essentially what we found is that in our three communities, yes, we saw a difference in sort of the ranking of preferences, but that there were enough similarities that as long as you use multiple formats and multiple approaches, you'll be able to um, essentially meet everyone's needs. In terms of communication, the second tool in the toolbox, Informational materials, the information that we develop, needs to emphasize homeowner priorities. We need to remove ourselves as natural resource managers and educators out of that um, equation. Take our environmental hat off and really develop our informational materials with the homeowner priorities in mind. So we need to focus on their benefits, being reducing maintenance burdens to the homeowners, freeing up land for other purposes, increase in property values associated with sewer over septic, and then the human health benefits. Those are the four that really rank to the top in terms of perceived benefits of these programs. And in developing these informational materials, take advantage and brand them with the county government or local utility logos. Because people want information, they're actively seeking information, and these are the two sources that they want to get that information from. So these are sort of those hypothetical examples I was talking about. One of the primary forms of method um, delivery that people wanted to get that information from was through the mail. So a lot of times before you even begin a septic to sewer conversion project, you want to just inform the community that this is happening in your neighborhood. So these would be examples of mailers. So little postcards just saying, hey, this is happening in your community, focusing on the perceived benefits um, while highlighting the logo name, a website, because that was the second major focus um, format to receive information, as well as a point of contact information. So for example, really prioritizing that benefit of reducing maintenance burdens on the homeowner, the one on the left, post the holidays without the added stress, convert to sewer and leave the maintenance to us. 
very simple, very straightforward, really maximizing the perceived benefits of reduced maintenance on the homeowners and providing all of the necessary information for individuals to find out more. The one on the right focuses on a different set of perceived benefits. So this is freeing up land for other uses as well as um, maintenance burdens. Finally, build the she shed of your dreams, convert to sewer and reclaim your land and your time. So this is a way to take advantage and um, identify multiple benefits associated with septic to sewer conversion that were identified by our residents. The last one takes sort of a different approach. Remember, this is a way to not everyone is gonna have the same opinions and thoughts. So use multiple approaches and multiple formats. This one focuses on the investment in um, human health. So human health was also recognized as a potential benefit of these programs. And so sending out a mailer, focusing on the human health aspect of it, having that logo there, really branding it, again, having the website and the phone number, another format for information dissemination, a point of contact um, for people to ask questions. And then this one was a way um, to facilitate community meetings. So again, um, we don't expect you to go out and reproduce these formative research methodologies to understand what the biggest priorities are for your community. Um, we don't expect you to do interviews and focus groups and surveys. But a community meeting ranked as one of those primary methods of information dissemination that residents wanted. So take advantage of that format and use it to start a dialogue with these communities and really ask them, okay, what are your biggest barriers? What are your biggest benefits? And start that conversation. Removal of barriers. The only barrier that we had were those upfront costs. If upfront costs can be dispersed over time, then that financial barrier can be eliminated. A lot of programs use rebates. Rebates may not be an incentive for residents because they do not eliminate that upfront financial cost. And we saw this um, regardless of where we looked in all of our case study examples. Convenience. People want information, um, don't be afraid to give it to them and give it to them in multiple formats. Enhance your mailings and update your websites to include timely, accurate, and community-specific information. Um, on, you know, again, they found everything to be useful. So provide project-specific details, construction timelines, list of contractors, upfront costs, but then also accurate estimates of what recurring costs could be. Diffusion and norms. These are two concepts that maybe you won't be familiar with um, just by name alone, but in concept, you're probably very familiar with them. So diffusion is that idea that um, once you see someone doing something or once you talk to someone, it's more likely to be um, accepted by members of the community. So in our we live in a little cul-de-sac. There's about six homes as an example of diffusion. Um, we installed when we moved in two years ago, a solar hot water heater for our pool. Very shortly thereafter, our neighbor asked us about it, asked us how we felt about it, asked us our experience, and then they installed one. Last week, another neighbor, we told them we were going swimming. They asked us how, wasn't our pool freezing? We talked to them about, you know, oh, we have this solar hot water heater. They're installing it. So it's that conversation, seeing other people doing things, asking them about their experience, often leads to um, a behavior change. Social norms is the same idea. It's that expectation of what is expected of you from your community, your friends, your neighbors. And so you can create a visible campaign of simple, consistent signs and display them in the community. This is that place at the home. Or work with community ambassadors. People are already in the community. People are already respected and have those relationships to create dialogue. And this is examples of what that would look like. So again, focusing on the benefits um, that were identified by our residents 
and creating sort of yard signs at the point of um, construction. So trying to negate some of maybe the negative aspects of construction and inconvenience and promoting those benefits of this house just increased its property value by 8%. Ask us how. The ask us how is extremely important because that's what starts the dialogue. And again, you have your logo there. You have your website for more information and the point of contact. You're branding yourself and you're focusing on the benefits. The one on the right uses social norms and environmental health. Together, we protected the health of our community. Social norming, we are doing this together. It's not an individual project. This is something that our community is doing collectively. And we prevented more than one ton of nitrogen from entering our waterways. Ask us how. So those again are just examples and they can be done um, you know, as stickers or, or just something that's visible at the point, the place part of the four P's um, marketing mix. So that was a sort of a in-depth overview of the formative research and the strategies. And I hope that through the materials and through our research that you feel sort of empowered enough and that you have enough information to maybe move forward and implement the next three steps in the social marketing process. So take some of these um, results and strategies that we developed for you, pilot them, see if they're successful, see if you have community buy-in or if you need to tweak them, implement the program and evaluate it for success. Um, all of the resources that we developed for this project are available online at the water.ifis.ufl.edu website. Uh, we created a local government resource tab under septic systems. What you're seeing on the right hand side is a one page issue guide. This essentially condenses all of that barriers, benefits, communication information um, for you in a really simple one page infographic. We also have uh, the, a more robust survey report available on the website. And we are developing in the process of developing a, a guidelines for the community based social marketing. Um, techniques, so how to actually implement it going through those individual tools and recommendations. So that will hopefully be on the website within um, the next month. We also, if you're interested in other resources, I've provided a list for you. And we don't expect you to be, you know, outreach or education or social marketing experts. Your, you know, natural resource um, managers, we don't, can't expect you to be everything to everyone. So go out and partner with your extension agents, community-based social marketing um, practitioners, your marketing individuals at you know the county or municipality we work with, and really develop sort of a robust uh, social marketing campaign so that you get better buy-in and acceptance. So with that, I want to thank our funders and my partners, and I will take any questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Krimsky. Um, yeah, at this time, just want to remind everyone that you can use the chat box to put those questions in, um, and we'll be taking those um, kind of as you bring them in. There were a couple in there already, so we'll go ahead and address those, but as you're thinking of them, just put them in there. Uh, looks like we still have about 10 minutes or so. So uh, towards the beginning, uh, Dr. Krimsky, there was a question um, that asked about uh, the knowledge assessment questions, um, particularly the ones, how often do septic systems need to be pumped? Um, did you have an option for I don't know? And if you did or didn't, was there a reason for that? So we didn't. Um, these were multiple choice. We also um, did not have the um, no question was required. So essentially, we assumed that if an individual didn't know that they then skipped uh, the question. That was the reason why we didn't have the I don't know option there. Okay, great, great. Um, did in any of the survey information, uh, did you include or ask about removing old septic tanks uh, as part of the conversion program? We did not. Um, that was part of sort of the process involved in septic to sewer. And so we didn't ask specifically about the removal of septic tanks, but we did talk about it sort of got at it in the, the steps involved in conversion, because that is definitely one of the steps involved. Right. Yeah. And I think 
some of that information you presented on after that question was asked. Mm -hmm. So yeah. Um, let's see a couple more questions coming in. So I'll just read those as they're coming in. Um, we, uh, we currently have a 20 year payment for septic to sewer conversion about 575 per year. Um, is this time too short or too long? Uh, do you have an idea of what is a sweet spot for payment? Um, no, we specifically didn't do a willingness to pay that was sort of above and beyond the aspects of this project. Um, my gut reaction is that the $575 per year is definitely in that sweet spot. Um, when we were talking with individuals, you know, their upfront costs were in the thousands plus dollars. Um, and so I think the expectation of anything less than $1,500 a year, and this is gut, there's, this is not scientific, you know, related, this is just based off of conversations and anecdotals, that that would be much more manageable. Great. Um, before we get to a couple of our other questions, I know there was one about um, general questions about the recording of the presentation and the slides. Um, just want to let everyone know um, the recording uh, will be sent out to everyone. And Dr. Krimsky, if if you would be okay with it, I can include a copy of the of the PDF of the slides. Um, if that's something. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I can also post the presentation online and I'll go back a page. Again, um, the actual report for the, the survey instrument is available on that website. So if you want to see the individual breakdown of each of the questions and the responses, um, you can access it at the water.ifis website. Perfect, excellent. And I'll include that link as well in the follow-up email to everyone that registered. Um, so let me go ahead and see if we have any other questions. And if you see any, Lisa, you can also uh, okay. grab them as well. So here's a question. Um, where are you seeing funding for the off-property wastewater system extensions for septic to sewer? Um, where am I seeing funding for off-property wastewater system? I don't, um, I don't have an answer to that question. Um, again, we didn't investigate sort of the individual sources of funding. Do you know that there's you know, a variety of different sources that communities are getting, but I didn't look at the, I can't provide an answer to that sure, question, sure. sorry. Yeah, and if, if Mike, if you want to clarify your question a little <laughs> bit, um, you're welcome to do that in the chat. Let's see. So someone, um, posted and said great presentation, which I think we all, all agree. Uh, from 10 plus years of experience with septic to sewer, I've ident I have identified cost as the main barrier. Uh, additionally, the community's ability to pay is represented very differently. The higher the property value, the greater it is framed as private property rights, uh, while lower the property value, it is presented as a cost. So good comment there. Yeah, and that's, um... I would say, again, you know, I'm only looking at three communities as a case study, so it's really worth going into the communities and having that conversation with them. Um, I found, though, that despite the challenges associated with cost, that some of the more lower income communities were actually the ones that were most willing and excited to have these projects in their community because they saw it as a means um, for increasing their property values. So it was something that they were really looking forward to having in their community. Wonderful.
last question I see coming in uh, on the water.ifis website. Will you be sharing your survey? I know you mentioned you'll be sharing some of those survey pieces. Um, if we are interested in finding out the priorities of our local communities. Yeah, I think so. Um, I don't think I'd have a problem doing that. I um, need to write the final report first <laughs> before we get that posted. Um, but Shannon, I can definitely share it with you. But I also want to encourage you that you know, this project did the legwork for you. I don't really think you have to go out there and repeat this survey instrument verbatim um, because we did not find as many differences as we expected. So maybe just going out there and having that conversation is sufficient for your needs. But yes, um, once we get approval, I'm happy to, to share the survey document with you, the survey instrument, sorry. Very good. There was one comment in here that says um, uh, your comment on lower value properties being more willing to connect is spot on. So that's a um, good comment there from Carlos. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. I mean, and you in the field, you know this all more you know, than I do. It's just a way of repackaging the information we all know in a way that um, resonates with the individuals. And that's what social marketing is all about. It's just a repackaging.